Uh, good evening, friends. Uh, and I, I'm really surprised to see so many people that I actually recognize over here come from different parts of, of, of Goa. Uh, right off, let me thank the Saligao Institute for inviting me to be part of this very pleasant evening of uh, music and books, literature, and after this even history when Alan speaks about his book. Uh, and asking me to, you know, Rico asked me to share uh, a few of my thoughts on the craft of writing short stories. Uh, now, uh, I know that there are among you already, I can see uh, people who, who, who have already published. So there are writers. There are, I don't know whether I'm able to don't worry. project. Uh, don't worry, don't worry. You can hear? It's okay, I'll, I'll, I'll stand. You'll be more comfortable and you'll give us more, more tips. You want me to sit? No, no, sit, stand. Sir. Whatever you want. Whatever you want. I'll sit when I get tired. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I know that there are writers already over here and I know that some people are aspiring writers. But I also know there are people who are neither writers nor aspiring to be writers, but who are readers. I mean, since all of you have come to this Saligao Book Fair. Uh, readers are very important people for writers. I mean, the, the president of the Saligao Institute, Dean, builds houses so that other people can live in them. The canticle chorus sang so that other people could hear them. Uh, writers write so that other people can read them. Without re readers, writers are actually nobody. So it is in that spirit I thought that we could have this uh, conversation. This is not a writer's workshop. It is certainly not a speech. Uh, I'm not qualified to speak on literature. There are literature professors here already. But uh, I thought we could have this conversation. And so please feel free to button at any time uh, to ask questions. Uh, and uh, you can ask questions while I'm speaking, or we can ask, uh, you can ask questions after I've finished sharing whatever I wanted to share with you. Uh, what I will be talking about is how I, I approach writing. It is not necessarily the, the, the only way to do it, or, and certainly not the best way to do it, but this is how I approach writing my short stories. What I have done is try to answer a few questions that are frequently asked when I, when I speak to groups, and I put those questions together. Now, the, the, the first question I'm generally asked is, uh, what is the difference between uh, a novel and a short story? Uh, Laurie Moore famously said, uh, a novel is like a marriage, and a short story is like a brief affair. Now, I don't actually uh, agree with that uh, view of Laurie Moore, because it implies that a novel requires commitment like a marriage, Whereas a short story like an affair doesn't require commitment. I think that in fact short stories require an equal amount of commitment both from the part of the writer as well as from the part of the, of the reader. Now, one thing that a short story is not is it's not a condensed novel. And a novel is not an expanded short story. The two are different genres. And what distinguishes a short story, of course, is because it's short, the characters are fewer. You can't have the number of characters that you have in a novel. The experiences are fewer because you can't bring in so many episodes and so many experiences. You have to decide what you want to talk about and put that into a short story. How long should a short story be? Uh, you know, I mean, you, they can be very long and then they become novellas. And uh, they can also be very, very short, like you know, the trend these days that you also get on WhatsApp, micro stories, and some of them are extremely short, and you know, 25 words, 30 words, but they pack in a lot of punch. There's that famous micro story of just seven words, just seven words, brilliantly written. For sale, uh, baby's boots, blue, never used. Now that's just seven stories, seven words, but it brings in uh, a lot for the reader to think about. No? 
why, what, and, and you can imagine so many things. You can imagine the, the couple that is putting up those, those, those booties for sale and what they must have gone through and why those booties were never used. So, so they, you can ha even have micro short stories. But generally what I'm talking about is short stories that range, say, between 2,000 and 5,000 words. This is the normal length, 3,000, 4,000 words, is the normal length of a short story. Now, the plan I use when I set out to write a short story is that I make, I make a little plan. It can be a, a little tree or a draft, but a plan which says these are going to be the characters and this is going to be the plot of the short, short story. Now, you have only two, three thousand words to get to that plot. And, uh, you know, it's not a novel where you have 50,000 or 100,000 words where you can bring it in slowly. You have to bring in your plot quickly. You can't meander around because if you start meandering, your, your length is over, the story is over, and you haven't told, told anyone anything. So, you, I, I make a plan. Now, that plan that you make, it can just be on a single sheet of paper, you know. But that plan is not cast in stone. Uh, it'll change when you start writing. Uh, and if it changes, fine, you may choose to change it. But uh, I, I, uh, it's important to have the plan so you know where you are going and you make every page of your story count. Another thing, uh, I always begin with having an idea of how the story is going to end. I think it's important to have that idea of where it's going to end, you see. Unlike, you know, you have this famous uh, horror story writer, Stephen King. Now, Stephen King says, when I begin writing, that is, when he begins writing, he doesn't know how his stories are going to end. He says, I, I, I just create interesting characters, and then I allow the characters to do what they want to do. Now, I suppose, I mean, Stephen King is a great writer, so he can, he can do that. But for lesser mortals, I think we need to know where we are going. Otherwise, we can get lost in, you know, uh, in, in a mire of things. Now, the end need not actually, when you write it, the end need not be the end you have thought of. Even that is not cast in stone. There are stories that I've written where I had intended the end to be something, but while I was writing it, I felt that the end should be something else. So the end can change. But you need to have an idea of an end, not necessarily the end, but an end in the beginning, if you want your story to actually uh, progress in a way that keeps you engaged with the, with the writer. And I think another very important thing in a short story is the title. Often I think of the title right in the beginning. Sometimes this too changes. The title also changes because nothing is cast in stone. You afterwards realize maybe a different title will, will actually uh, be, a, be a better title to use. But it's important to have that title because very often a title is a hook. But you know, a short story, especially if it's published in a collection of short stories of various writers and people are just going through it or they're checking it on the net, the title of that short story is going to be the hook, which is going to attract people to read that story. So the title is important, and as important as the title is the first line or the first paragraph of the story. I mean, if you can actually get a brilliant first line, that is, that is marvelous. I mean, even famous novels, you know, last night I dreamt of Mandalay. The first line of Rebecca. Now, lines like that simply attract attract a reader. But it's not always easy to get an attractive first line. But you can certainly try to get an attractive first paragraph. Because again, if you are not going to put in your attractive first paragraph, something about the first paragraph should excite the reader the style or the, or, 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 or the problem or the challenge or the reader must wonder what is going to come after this first paragraph and want to read more. So that is important. Now, the moment you introduce, your, again in your short story, you have to begin introducing your, your characters and you have to give your characters 
a back story. Everyone has a back story, you know, because the short story doesn't happen uh, in the air. Like, you know, there are very few slice of life stories. We'll talk about them. They're very difficult to write, but we'll talk about them. I'm talking about the regular story. But every character has a life. Every character has some depth. And again, you are not, you don't have a novel. I mean, you don't have the, the, the luxury of 80,000 words. You've got to put all this in 3,000 words. So you've got to give your characters a backstory. Now, this backstory of the characters, what, what is their background that has brought them to this point in what you are talking about in your 3,000 words? Now, this backstory that you bring in, there are two ways that you can bring it in. Uh, and, and often you can use a combination of the two ways. One way is narrative. You actually say this, this, this about this person. The other way is dialogue, conversation. Now, only narrative doesn't work. Only narrative will begin to read like a child's fairy tale. So you need to bring in more than just narrative, more than just saying, you know, so-and-so is so-and-so, this is so-and-so's background, and then so-and-so this, and so-and-so did that. You have to bring this in through dialogue. Mm -hmm. I find that dialogue is actually uh, one of the more difficult things to write because dialogue should not sound stilted and at the same time it can't be terribly colloquial because again as I say you don't have the luxury of 50,000 words so you've got to pack all this in together one way at least one trick that I use when trying to write dialogue is to to write what I want to and then to read it aloud to read it aloud not once but twice two three four times and to see does this sound like a real conversation or is it sounding, you know, something stilted? If it sounds stilted, you'll have to rewrite it. If it sounds like a real conversation, fine. Then you, you have achieved something. And so you can then go ahead with your, with your story. So this relates to, to, to bringing, bringing in your characters before you come to your plot. Now, another very important point, uh, I, I, I think, is, is uh, research, you see. Now, when you write a story, you could be writing your story in the present, which is fine. You could be setting your story, uh, you know, you have to say where you're setting your story. So you could be setting it in a city or a place that's familiar to you, a time that is familiar to you. Or you could be setting your story in the past or in a place that is not around you. It could be a story about history, it could be something. But whatever you, you, you use, your story has to sound credible, it has to sound real, it has to be believable, and therefore you have to do research. Like for example, one, one story of mine uh, which, uh, which won a prize, uh, Amish Tripathi, if you heard of the writer Amish Tripathi, he, 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 was, on the, he was the chairman of the, of, the, of the judges, and they had asked for a story. Now his condition was, this story should involve uh, a murder, and it should be set in 300 BC in the city of Ujjain. This was, this, was the, this was the condition for the short story. So naturally that, that, that did require uh, uh, a bit of research. Uh, what was Ujjain in the 3rd century BC? What was happening not only in Ujjain but around Ujjain uh, uh, in the 3rd century BC? And how do you then bring in a murder and yet and do all this in 3,000 words. So it was interesting, the, the story that I wrote was called uh, Seeds of Doubt. Uh, and uh, it, 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 I think, it must have appealed to Amish Tripathi because he gave it the, the first prize for that thing and it's going, to be the, it's going to be part of a collection that's going to come out in a couple of months, uh, which is called uh, The Day Nehru Died and Other Stories. Not Times of India? Not the Times of India one. Yes, this is the Times of India season three. Season three. This was in Times of India season and three. Earlier also you won. Earlier also I won. I won um, in season two where uh, Arvind uh, Neelakantan was the judge. You know, the, the, the one who wrote uh, Bahubali and uh, uh, things. And his, of course, he just had given a line. And that story, uh, which uh, another country, another time, is what I wrote. And I set that in Pachmari. Now, Pachmari, fortunately, I was familiar with. 
So I was able to describe the geography and the setup are there. That's very unfair. <laughs> no, no, he, didn't, he said you can write it wherever you like. No, but this, actually that, that is the tip that I'm trying to give you is that uh, you can do your research and if you choose to place your story in an unfamiliar place or unfamiliar time. But actually some of the best stories come out uh, most authentically if you place them with places that are familiar to you. In fact, that, that was my collection of Goa short stories, which, uh, which is one for sorrow, two for joy which is actually all set in Goa. For that, that really required no research. Because I was familiar with what I was writing about, I was familiar with the characters that I introduced in that. So you, you, you can always choose that option. Uh, again now, for example, suppose you choose to write a, a, a story uh, uh, on science fiction. Now that was another, I've only written one story, a, a science fiction story called The, uh, the Phage Anomaly. That too is included in the forthcoming book. But science fiction also, you see, you do require to do some research because you can't just, if you simply write a story like, uh, you know, uh, completely fantastical, it's not going to appeal to anyone. You know, what are, what are the brilliance of Isaac Asimov's uh, 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 sh short story, science fiction? That he always roots the story in some believable laws of science, you know, the believable, there has to be some accepted laws of physics, laws of chemistry, and then he may, he will accept three laws, one law will change, and then he goes off into his science fiction. So, but that makes the story believable. So, you do that in science fiction, you do that in when you write historical fiction, historical fiction also you think of characters that may not have existed characters that did things that were not there but it has to be rooted in a context that is believable you can't create a whole history because then the whole thing becomes uh, you know like a fantasy which becomes sometimes very difficult you can only do it in a novel you can't do it in a short story so the, the point i'm making is that whether you're writing historical fiction whether you're writing science fiction whether you're writing stories in the present whether you're writing about rural areas whether you're writing about urban areas you have to root them in some kind of reality and if you are not familiar with that reality then you have to do research for it. Research is also exciting sometimes when you're doing the research it gives you the idea for another story and you can note it down and keep it separate and you know uh, computers have really made all this so easy to be able to things don't have to be written longhand you can just put little things and leave them on pages in a folder and then you can go back to them whenever you want. Now, uh, uh, the, uh, another issue is, where do I end the short story? You know, where do I end it? Uh, there are writers, very good writers, who will tell you, you end a story when you have nothing more to say. Now, that sounds brilliant, but you know, it's not really practical advice because it, it, you, you, you need to have some practical advice about knowing where to end your story. Now, I say that actually I, a short story, I end at a point when you have to satisfy your reader. Your reader has to feel satisfied that all the questions and issues that you have raised in the earlier part of the story, not necessarily a mystery story, a mystery story, yes, you have to answer the mystery, but there can be situations elsewhere that come to a satisfactory resolution. And it does not mean that everyone has to be happy in the end and walk off hand in hand into the sunset. No, even a tragedy can be extremely satisfying. You know, all the tragedies of Shakespeare, they're, there. they're all tragedies. But a tragedy can also be satisfying. It resolves a situation. In fact, many of my short stories uh, are, are sort of end with, <laughs> with tragedies. My daughter-in-law told me, you only write about death, you only write about <laughs> sorrow. I said, no, there are other stories that I write that have got nothing to do with, <laughs> with death or sorrow. But yeah, so, uh, but it needs to, you, you know, you need to resolve. And if you leave a question mark at the end, you can leave in some stories a question mark, like you, you, you see in little short films and all, a question mark left at the end. That too is nice, but it should be a kind of a question mark where the reader feels encouraged and happy to take that forward or question it in his own name. But something which is left 
unsatisfied if you leave the reader you've not really answered all the all the the, the, the problem that you have raised in your story, I don't think that that short story is going to be very uh, uh, successful. Another very interesting device is a twist in the tale. I love that. I love reading short stories that end with a twist at the end of the story. And so I try to put them into my own stories because I think those are very satisfying, but not necessarily. I mean, you know, stories need not really have a twist at the end. You can have, as what I was referring to, those slice of life stories. Slice of life, life stories are stories that don't have really uh, a great plot. They are just literally a slice of life, what describing things. Now, even these stories work, but for a slice of life story to work, you have to write it brilliantly because the only thing that is working for it is language you know in, other, in a story with a plot with a twist there is the plot there is that interest also working for it but in a slice of life story it is only language and nothing else that is going to carry this forward so you have to then work on that part of it another thing that I do at least when I when I write my story is edit 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 now, you know, I was talking to uh, Damodar, uh, Damodar Bhai Mauzo, the Goa Nyan, Nyanpit Award winner, one of our finest story writers in Konkani and also in translation. I've only read him in translation. And I was talking to him and, and he, he said he never edits his work. He says, once I've written, I've written. I don't edit. I don't go back to it. And I found that brilliant. But it's, okay, with his level of brilliance, I suppose you can do it. But otherwise, I think one needs to edit. Uh, I edit while I write. I keep changing. I've written half the story. Every time I go back to the story, I read what I've written so far. So you that know, the continuity that's an English, is maintained. That's an English tradition, is it? What? Of editing a lot. <laughs> I only write in English, so I don't know. But I, but I edit. You don't have slice of life story. Can you explain what you mean by slice of life? By slice of life, I mean a story that need not have a, any actual plot. You are only describing what, you know, maybe a day in somebody's life. Uh, uh, you know, a story doesn't immediately come to mind, but there are many stories, there are many short films which are based on such stories. You are, you are simply describing what is happening uh, in a particular place, in a village, or in a town, or in a chawl, or in a slum, or anywhere in a family. Uh, but there is no actual plot. Like there is no uh, difficulty and then there is no resolution of that difficulty. It's more a descriptive thing, a description of, of, uh, of uh, maybe, and, and, and there has to be dialogue because merely describing doesn't work. So there will be dialogue, there will be a situation, but it may be like a day in the life of somebody. You know, so it, it, it is an authentic description of some aspect of somebody's life somewhere. But it doesn't really have a plot or a mystery. So it really has to work only on the basis of language. Your language should be such that it's attractive for people to read. And therefore I say that's perhaps one of the most difficult kind of stories to write. And I was talking about editing. So I, I edit, and I think that editing is important for all of us, excepting, I say, if you, you know, you're a brilliant writer like Mauzo or somebody, but because editing actually shows respect for your reader, you know? You can't expect, you can't subject your reader, you can't burden your reader with the first outpourings of your heart and expect, and readers are, are paying money, you know, for your book. They are buying your book at 200 rupees or 300 rupees or whatever or those very overpriced books that, uh, that, that, that Rico publishes, none of which are less than 500 rupees, but, <laughs> but you're paying money for them, and so you have to respect your reader. You can't just burden your reader. This is what I felt, this is what I thought. That you reserve only for a diary, if you write a diary. I never write a diary, but any of those of you who write diary. But otherwise, you have to edit. You have to, and you edit, read aloud, when you finished it, put it away for three days, then go back to it. And that is why actually, actually, working to a word limit, even when there is no word. And if you're writing for a competition, they'll always give you a word limit. But if you're writing not for a competition, you're simply writing 
still working to a word limit helps because that helps you pare away what is unnecessary. You say, no, I'm not going to write more than 4,000 words in this story. But then you can go and, you know, when if you, again, all this has become so simple when you, when you, when, when you were using a computer, you know the words, you know exactly how many words are where at every, at every moment. So writing to a word limit helps you uh, make your story tighter, crisper, remove something unnecessary, go over dialogue again. So editing is important and also editing even on questions of you know grammar and uh, and and uh, uh, usage yes you know uh, punctuation I mean punctuation they say are really the traffic signals that that prevent words meeting with accidents and and you know that that's true because all of you have read so many things about misplaced commas changing meanings of whole things but you know but even grammar I mean you know sometimes there are issues in grammar my my son of all, but he, my son is an engineer, he's got nothing to do with the literature, but he's a, he's a grammar Nazi. So I, I, I send my stories first to Malusha and she reads them and she tells me what she feels like. And then I send them to my son and my son tells me if there are any grammar mistakes in, the, in, in what, I've, what I've written. But I think that's important. You, you, you need to, to, uh, to, uh, to be particular about using correct grammar also because then you, you are respecting your reader. You're respecting your reader. And uh, yeah, and uh, the, the last little bit I have before I end this is uh, what you do when you have writer's block. <laughs> you, know? uh, you, you either can't get an idea for a story or you have your idea for your story and you know you've written some of it and then you, you can't uh, 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 go forward. Uh, my solution is uh, for removing writer's block is reading. I just put away what I have done, I pick up something and read something else. And I think that reading uh, necessarily unlocks writer's block. I don't think anybody who doesn't read should even attempt to write, you know. You probably will write uh, very mediocre stuff. So you need to read, everyone needs to read. I mean, re reading creates better writing. And the, the best way to get out of writer's block is to read. And I found that if you begin reading, you've hardly read 20 pages or half a day's reading, and immediately your writer's block uh, leaves you, and then you put away your book and you, you, you continue with writing what, what you have to write. Now, there is also, you know, people say, <laughs> don't do as I do, but do as I say. And this last little piece of advice is, uh, is in that spirit. I, mean, you know, I, I myself am not very disciplined. I don't write every day, put aside half an hour to write every day. Uh, but I think that that is important also. Because in certain periods of my life when I've done it, uh, certain uh, stretches, <laughs> sometimes of days, sometimes of weeks, but you know, and then sometimes never. Uh, I can't tell you lies because Malusha is seated here. <laughs> but uh, otherwise they would have told you a few lies. But uh, in any case, writing fiction is also writing lies, you know, so what is there? But, you know, I, I, uh, to, to be honest, um, uh, writing, uh, I think, uh, a little bit every day. You need not publish what you write. Eh? Uh, everything that you write doesn't have to be published at all. Uh, but uh, writing uh, frequently, even small paragraphs, is helpful in anything. I mean, you know, it's like exercise. Uh, you know, you're preparing for a sports event, you have to exercise every day. You're preparing for a musical performance, you have to practice every day, either singing or an instrument or whatever. Without practicing, it doesn't come. So, I mean, writing too is like that. And it's just simply right. But if you're writing to be published, then you need to have that kind of respect for your reader, of giving your reader the best. And so a little bit of writing, and if it's not too good, it can be discarded, or it can be redone, but a kind, a kind of a, a little more frequent writing is, is, is useful. And last, having a little space, a writing space of your own. Uh, I think, I mean, you have a room and all that, but most of us don't have that pleasure of having a room to ourselves. But a desk, a desk is also enough where you can put your computer, your little books, your papers, your writing material, where you can grab something that you've jotted down while seeing something. You may be seeing a movie on Netflix and something else has struck you or a nice turn of phrase and you like that and uh, you want to write that down because that will give you ideas for something else so you note it on a little paper. So even if you have a kind of a little desk to yourself, that's very useful because otherwise 
uh, grabbing and accessing these things when you're actually writing becomes difficult. So, yeah, I think I've said what I want to say, but I'm open to questions. How about yeah. the other book of short stories, Lopari? Uh, see, I've had uh, now uh, two books of short stories published. Uh, one was the... the, uh, the um, uh, the disrobing of Draupadi and other stories, those were uh, mostly stories that I had submitted to the uh, second season of uh, the Times of India Write India competition, where I won a first prize also. One of the, 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 the story that won the first prize there was uh, another, uh, another country, another time. And, um, and there were other stories. And one story I wrote which had nothing to do actually with the Times of India, that is those 11 stories got published there. The second one was, uh, that was published was, were all short stories that are set in Goa. It was called One for Sorrow, Two for Joy. It, one for Sorrow, Two for Joy is not the name of any one story there. Like the disrobing of Draupadi was, the, was one story. And had nothing, the disrobing of Draupadi had nothing to do either with Draupadi or with her dis disrobing. There's another little background.